it's definitely not your mother's Marie Antoinette. This is definitely a Marie Antoinette for now, for this moment in our history. And it's about a lot of things, but I think it really came out of David Ajmi's brain when he was thinking about the 99% versus the 1%. And what is this age that we're in where we're having this increasing divide of great wealth versus an increasing lower um, echelon of wealth. And I think he was also thinking a lot about celebrity and this age where we're so obsessed with celebrity and we create celebrities and then we devour celebrities. We want to watch them in all of their glory and we especially want to watch them when they fall. And I think he's thinking about power. What is power in our world? Do we think Marie Antoinette has power? Do we think she has it from the beginning? Who do we think really has the power and who actually does have the power? Uh, who's really running the world? I think I had, you know, a pretty common perception of her um, as a fashion icon, as a scapegoat, someone who sort of represented everything that we're in society taught to hate about the rich, someone of extreme privilege who was out of touch with, with her people. I had some judgment within that, just innately. You know, I really discovered her humanity. Really, she never had a chance. Like, mm -mm. the odds were stacked against her from the very beginning, and the seeds of revolution, I think, had already been planted and had begun to been, have been sown long before she ever came to France, was in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, who didn't really know any other way to be than, than how she was. That surprised me, and I, it also surprised me how, how much I empathized with her. You know, I felt for her. Part of what Marie Antoinette is about is excess, mm -hmm. right? So we had a lot of fun looking at, first of all, fashion. Every major fashion designer of the 20th and the 21st century has had a Marie Antoinette phase, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It's really been an obsession for a long time, and so we felt we needed to embrace that, and we looked a lot at the modern fashion designs and what people are wearing now to big galas, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a bit of synchronicity between then and now. The juxtaposition of the modern vernacular and, and the, the period-ish costume is, it's helpful because it helps me maintain that sort of, you know, I have to carry my head in a certain way to support the weight of these wigs and I have to move in a certain way that kind of conveys the opulence of the time. Mm -hmm. And um, the costume track is like its own play. For Emily as the actor, having to keep track of her arc as a character and still go off and be completely stripped <laughs> and have a new costume put on is, is a real feat. I have this impression in this play that the entire time she's, she's trying to figure out who she is, if she's anyone, mm -hmm. underneath all of that. And that's, I mean, I think that we can all identify with that, you know. I think that most people spend their entire lives trying to figure out who they are. And, and when you are built, as she says, to be this one thing, and then all of that just gets ripped away from you. And even when it starts to slip away, it, she has to find something else to sort of fill that void. And, and that's kind of a dream as an actor to get to, to explore that about this famous or infamous historical figure that so many people have all these misperceptions about. And I feel like I will always feel a very close connection to her because of this experience. Mm -hmm.